And I couldn't help but think when we talk about what's happened to the farmers by the middlemen and by other people, that nothing really changes very much. Apparently it's still much more profitable to farm the farmers than it is to farm the farms. And we find the same people again getting the money. We hear the stories about the national administration. Let me just say to you that I have not been surprised by what's happened in this administration. We said these things during the 1972 election campaign because I had spent a number of months in Washington. I was there under the government phase two program, served on the pay board from November of 1971 through March of 1972. We were convinced at that point that this was the co most corrupt administration in the history of this nation. But we over the years have had a good relationship with the Farmers Union. We have had the same hopes, dreams, aspirations, the same responsibilities. And as Mr. Carpenter said this morning in keynoting this, we are beset by the same problems, the problems of high interest rates, the problems of scarcities, and many of the other problems that have been talked about here today. We are also all now brought under controls of the things that are happening throughout the world. It has been said here, and it's true, that the problem now of the food problem is not a local problem or a short-term problem, it's a world problem. And our union has said and President Woodcock of our union has said on national television and in other places that this is a world problem and a problem that should not be blamed upon the farmers. And I can tell you last spring, when there was great concern about this, I received a letter from your president, Ben Radcliffe, talking about the needs of the farmers and the need for understanding of the problems of the farmers. And I took that letter to many meetings that we had and pointed out to those meetings the things pointed out in that letter, that the problems we were having was not as a result of gouging by the farmers, but a result of policies in the country and things that were happening throughout the world. 1966, I made a trip to the Soviet Union with the tour group, and I came back at that time and said that in my opinion, in a few years, we would have a world food problem because what was happening then and what has happened since then is not only is there an increase in population throughout the world, but as there becomes greater affluence and greater money to spend for foodstuffs, two things happen. People eat more and they eat better. And we find that in the Soviet Union, in Eastern and Western Europe, in Japan, in other countries, people are turning from a diet of cereals to more of a diet of meat. And we all know that it takes much more foods to grow meat than it does if you eat the cereals themselves. We've also found that there's been a change in the food supply around the world. And we are affected by that food supply. When there's a scarcity of anchovies off the coast of South America, that makes a change in the matter of the food problems around the world. And we talked this morning about the matter of corporate farming and the invasion of corporate farming into the farms of South Dakota and the rest of the country. But that's, again, only a piece of it. It's really only the tip of the iceberg of what's happened. We are facing generally the question of the multinationals, or now they call themselves the supranationals, not just the big companies taking over the land and the small industry in this country, as we saw it happen earlier. But now those companies and those large combines taking over and expanding in all of the various countries of the world. I have been in conferences that we've had in Western Europe and in Japan and other places. And I can tell you just for example in the implement industry, a majority of the tractors and implements that are built in Western Europe are built in the plants of the North American companies that are located in Western Europe. They aren't the plants of the European countries. I was in a conference in Brussels, and I went out to the Caterpillar plant there for a meeting with the company and union representatives and a luncheon with the representatives. There were 12 company representatives at this luncheon. 
11 of them were nationals that I knew from the United States. One of them was a Belgium. These are the people that circulate all over the world as part of that corporation policy. I was in Japan last January, and before we left, our ambassador had a reception at a cocktail party for the industry and labor representatives who was a part of the study group that I was a part of. One of the people that came there was the chairman of Caterpillar Mitsubishi of Japan, one of the big, heavy goods combines in Japan. The chairman of the Caterpillar Mitsubishi of Japan is a young fellow by the name of Slegel from Peoria, Illinois. These are the kinds of operations that we have going on the multinational corporations that are operating in every phase of the world, and we need to know that we are all affected by this and affected by the, the programs of these organizations. We are also affected by the same other policies. You've had a lot of conversation here about transportation and the movement of goods. And again, when I was in Japan, I was talking to the Nissan people that build the Datsun automobiles. And I was talking to them about the matter of their importing cars into this country, but not importing American-made cars into Japan. And they said, that's easy to explain. It isn't because of these different costs in labor and materials that we would be led to believe. He says it's because the American companies do not try to compete. If an American company sends a car over here, it costs them at least $500 to ship that car over, he says, from the United States to Japan. But they pointed out to me, and I was at a plant in Ohama, which is right outside of Yokohama, the port city in Japan, just a little ways from Tokyo. And we says, we have the Nissan company. We have nine big boats. The latest one that we just put into service will hold over 2,500 automobiles. We build our cars and we run them off of the assembly line here at Ohama. We drive them 30 miles over to the docks at Yokohama. We put them on one of these boats and we take them over to the west coast of the United States. We will unload that 2,500 cars, go down to Houston and pick up a load of grain and bring the load of grain back to Tokyo and we can deliver an automobile to the west coast of the United States for $100. We can't ship one from Detroit to Chicago for $100. This is the difference in the matter of pricing. And yet people will say to us, well, why is it they can build them in Japan and they can bring them over here and can sell them for less than this? Because they have, just as you have here in moving the grains and the rail cars, they have consolidated programs for shipping and movement of items, whether it be grain or automobiles or whatever it may be. And we in this country have gone too long without any regulate system, whether it's for transportation or the other items that we need to do. We also have the same kind of problems in world trade. There are people, there are people in the labor movement, there are parts of the labor movement that are opposed to free world trade. Our union is not in favor of that position. Our union is for free world trade and we are for the export of farm products. And I must say that there was great pressure there was great pressure, obviously, in the face of rising food prices to try to put exports on farm products. But I served with President Woodcock of our union on the President's Labor Management Advisory Council. And there we had discussions with Secretary Treasurer Schultz and other people. But the Secretary of the Treasurer obviously is concerned with the world trade situation, the balance of trade, the balance of payment, and the fact that even temporarily, if you shut off the exports, you may close out some of the world markets that we will need down the road as our increased production comes into playing and we need to have those markets to continue to having world trade. Because agricultural products is one of the main items, not only now but in the next several years, to balance off the trade and to have exports and to take up the things for imports that we will be importing from the other countries. And so we do need to have that. The problem here in the matter of foodstuffs is not, again, the matter that we're in short supply. Our supply is up, as you know, and it will continue to go up. The difference is because of the export and the sales on the foreign market. Where we were exporting about one-third of our agricultural products, we are now and will be in the next year or so exporting about two-thirds of our products. And then, of course, the price thing comes into play because those people who are playing in the market futures start trading with each other after they buy it from the farmers, as you know very well, and then trading with each other, the price goes up and up and up until it finally gets to the consumer. 
the price has doubled over what the farmer got when it left the farm in the first place. These are general kind of problems that you have and we have, and we must find answers to them. We're not going to find them in isolation. We must find them working together economically and politically. We also have a problem in this own country. While you are stretching your production facilities at the present time, and will continue to stretch those production facilities, we have that situation in industry now where markets have opened up. We all know, and I happen to bargain with the farm implement industry, that were, for many years farmers could not buy the products that they needed, and we understand that. And now since there is additional income on the farm, there is the additional cry for more production, then there is a greater demand for these items. What's happened is this demand now builds up faster than the production facilities can deliver them. You have integrated operations, and the companies are operating at 100% of capacity in many instances, in some cases, I guess, in more than 100%, really, because they're operating round the clock, at least in key plants, on a six- and seven-day basis. Because what happens within an integrated operation you can have a single plant that may be a key. I know, for example, right now an international harvester. There's a foundry down in Louisville, Kentucky, that works turning out castings in that foundry on three shifts every day. And those castings then have the very same transportation problems you've talked about. Those castings are put into trucks overnight to be delivered the next morning at plants three and 400 miles away to be machined and put into engines and put into other parts to immediately go on the, on the assembly line. And sometimes they run close enough that only an hour apart from time these pieces are delivered until they're moved into the line. And so if something happens in one of these bottleneck plants, then the whole production facility is slowed down. And this is one of the biggest problems we have now in negotiations. We're in negotiations. We can solve the economic problems, not really the way we should solve them, because as Cliff had just said to you, even though we have an inflation rate of over 8% now, we have an inflation rate that really affects you and I at the store of 30 to 40 to 50% on foods that we buy, about equal to that on fuel and gasoline, where 60% of our inflation is in these items, is in foodstuffs, fuel, and gasoline, and these are the items we can't make choices about because we have to spend for them. We may make choices on other things, and that's high. And while we are, we are stuck with a 5.5 or 6% wage formula, that creates problems as far as our membership is concerned, but I'm not here to complain about that. We can solve those problems. But the problems we really have trouble on is how do we continue to work out conditions under which we can get people to continue to work six and seven days a week, week after week, 10 and 12 hours a day, without the matter of time off and without getting up to their neck in problems so there are confusions at the workplace. The companies and unions have a joint responsibility to work out working conditions under which people can operate. In negotiations that I was in yesterday morning with International Harvester top company officials, one of the top company officials said to us in this meeting, we couldn't operate our plants on an integrated basis the way they are without the union and without a contract. I says, what you're really saying is you couldn't operate without a grievance procedure and a no-strike provision of the agreement. And they said, that's right. But we couldn't have a grievance procedure and the no-strike provision of the agreement if we didn't have a union. And therefore, no company on a big operator can't big integrated operation can operate satisfactory today without a union in the plant. Yet they don't tell you that. But we negotiate contracts on a three-year basis. And during that three years, you have the no-strike provisions, you have the grievance procedure for handling problems, and you have a procedure where we're both responsible for continuous production. So every three years, you have negotiations, and this is the chance for people I suppose to have a hiccup, if you may, to have, the, have pressure on the matter of solving those problems and going back to work. And this is what we are now doing in the process we're having in negotiations in both the auto industry and the implement industry. 
In the auto industry where our contracts expired in the middle of September, as you know we have negotiated new agreements with Chrysler. We will work out in the next few weeks new agreements with Ford and General Motors. In the implement industry, we had contracts expiring the 1st of October in John Deere, Harvester, and Caterpillar. We worked first in John Deere knowing the very important problems of keeping that company in operation because we know that the tractor plants are over nine months behind in orders. Parts plants are way behind in orders. And we reached agreement there one day before the contract expired so there would be no interruption in production. We operated on the extensions under the other two. And I've been in bargaining with Harvester for the last 10 days on a continuous basis. I left that bargaining table last night in Chicago. I'm going back to that table tonight. I thought I'd have a chance to get away for a day and not only have a chance to come and visit here, but to take a look at these things from a few miles away, and sometimes you can get a better picture of them. We'll go back to that. We have a deadline at Thursday noon. I hope we can find the answers to the problems. I said we can find the answers to the economic problems, all we can put into effect, because the companies are obviously making high profits at the present time. Whether we can find answers to all of these other problems, because we have the mutual responsibility of finding answers to how can we keep those plants and those assembly lines manned on a continuous basis, producing the goods and items that are needed to increase the foodstuffs of this country and to move it from farm to market and to build the roads and to do the other things that are needed. How can we do that and at the same time maintain the kind of conditions and the right of individual choice, if you please, for a worker if he has some other important things to do to get off a day now and then and not have to be tied completely to that line. That's the responsibility that we have and we're working on and we have to do something about it. I listened also at the luncheon at noon today and I again was very impressed by our common problems. And the young lady was talking about the matter of the change that take place and yes, there is great change. Times change and people change. But unfortunately, times change much faster than people change. And those of us, many of us here today, of my generation know that the change from our father's generation to our generation was relatively fast. Much faster, in fact, than the change from our father's generation to his father's generation. But you could almost keep up with it. But then the change that has taken place now from our generation to our children's generation and to our grandchildren's generation that are coming on. That change is taking place so fast that it's impossible for people to keep up with the change and many times we say we don't want to, we just as soon let it go by. And we just look at the change that's taking place in the technology, the changing that's taking place, as we say, in the makeup of the whole world operation. And we look at just such things as the satellites and we learn on the TV and you see instantaneous what's happening all over the world. And you can remember that it was only 16 years ago in 1957. The Soviet Union orbited the first little Sputnik, the little golf ball. And I remember going to meetings in those days and saying, in the lifetime of children being born today, a man will go to the moon. And they said, it's crazy, it can't happen, you're dreaming. That was just 16 years ago. Now, not only we go to the moon, we have the Skylabs up, we send about one crew up for a month and they come back and another one goes up for two months and they come back and another one will go up for three or four months and pretty soon they'll be running excursions to the Skylabs, excursions to the moon. This has happened in 16 years. And this is why I say it was very interesting today to see the program that you have to bring young people into this. Because the young people are the people that the world of tomorrow is going to belong to. And I don't think we can turn it over to them suddenly. Because we need the expertise and the wisdom of the people that have been around a long time. But we also need the enthusiasm and the concern of the young people in our communities and in our organizations, yours and mine. We have that problem and you have that problem. And just as we need to put together the expertise of the old, so do we also need to, in my opinion, have the relationship between the people who till the soil and produce the foodstuffs of America and those are the rest of the people who produce foods and fibers and services because if we're going to be a part of a world organization, certainly we have to coordinate together 
those segments that make up this country. And we have to work together economically and politically because none of us by ourselves are strong enough to get the things done that need to be done. Because all of us in one form or another are a minority because there is no such thing as a majority in this country. And so we need to meet, we need to talk, we need to have a cross-pollinization, if you please, of ideas and programs. And then we need to work together, as Ben pointed out, and I know Reuben Johnson will talk about, as our organizations have worked together at the national level on legislation to get for you the things that you need and to get for us some of the things that we need and to get for all of us the kind of economic and political and social programs that are good for us and our children because we all live in the same areas. Many of our members live in semi-rural areas. We are your best customers. You are our best customers. We go to the same churches, the same hospitals, the same schools. The things we have in common are much greater than the things that divide us. And unless we can do the job of working to solve our mutual problems and our individual problems, we will be in trouble. We can't look to national government to do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves. These are, in fact, some of the most troubled times of this nation. And we have to get leadership and strength back at the grassroots where it comes from. For that reason, I was most gratified to receive the invitation to come to your convention, even though it meant taking a day away from the bargaining table, because that was good for me to get a chance to look away a little bit from the problems that we all get immersed in when we're thinking about our daily things and get a broader look at those things that affect all of us. I certainly hope that you have a most successful convention I thank you for your cooperation in the past and hope that we can spend many years working together solving the problems that we all have and that we all must find answers to. Thank you. Back again, visit just briefly with friends of the Farmers Union. I'm going to keep my remarks very short because you have an excellent speaker here today to bring you up to date and to discuss with you the problems that exist in the power supply for rural electric cooperatives. I just want to say that during this past years and previous years, it's been a, a great help and inspiration to me to be able to call on your good president, Ben, and other officers and directors of your association when we meet with so many problems that we have during the past year. We only hope and pray that we can continue to merit support of the South Dakota Farmers Union at East River because so many things happen, so many questions come up, and I always get on the phone and call your good president and get his consultation on it, and I know after he has told me the feelings of the Farmers Union that I know I'm on the right track. I was interested in listening to Cliff Schroeder uh, earlier today. He was saying that a lady landed uh, at Sioux Falls and a pilot came on the the intercom system and said we are about to land at Sioux Falls so everybody please turn their watches back 10 years. What's happened to the rural electrification program in the past year I must admit I'm a little bit worried about even turning my watch back one hour come October 27th. Jim Grawl became manager of Basin Electric Power Cooperative in 1962 after having served as assistant general manager and director of Atomic Energy Service for the American Public Power Association since 1955. Mr. Grawl has a degree in chemistry from Antioch College and a degree in public administration from the Syracuse University. He has worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority, served in the U.S. Navy in World War II, and subsequently was employed by the U.S. Bureau of the Budget in management work and as budget analysis for the nuclear power program. He is a member of the Missouri Basin Systems Group Planning Committee, the Executive Advisory Committee for the Federal Power Commission's, Commission's National Power Survey, and of the Board of Directors of the American Public Power Association. My friends, I give you our friend and colleague from Bismarck, North Dakota, Jim Graw, General Manager of the Basin Electric Power Cooperative. Jim. Thank you, Ron. President Ben, officers and members of the South Dakota Farmers Union, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to take part in your program. 
This is uh, the 58th annual meeting, I understand, of an organization with a long and honorable history of fighting for the interests of the people of the Great Plains. And it is appropriate also that I report to you on Basin Electric Power Cooperative. The South Dakota Farmers Union, as you know, was one of the leaders in the early days in getting our regional wholesale power cooperative organized, and many of you and your leaders are active in Basin Electric, including our president, Art Jones, of Britain, South Dakota. Furthermore, the South Dakota G&Ts, or power supply cooperatives, in which many of you are active, are important sources of support currently, and they were in the forefront in the struggle to organize Basin Electric 12 years ago. I was asked to speak on the energy crisis and the rural electric cooperatives. I'm going to narrow that a little bit to the energy crisis and the rural electrics in the Missouri River Basin, and more particularly those in the Basin Electric Organization. The uh, cooperatives in South Dakota, with one exception, as you know, are all members of Basin Electric and purchase uh, a portion of their power supply from Basin Electric. With respect to the energy crisis, as it's called, I agree with Congressman Frank Denham that it is in, in, uh, to a degree, maybe to a major degree, artificial and contrived. But nevertheless, it is a crisis. And we do have energy shortages and energy problems. To consider how we cope with them, we might review the past to see how the rural people of this region solved them. For many years, the demands made on this, energy, this region's energy resources were primarily demands on the soil to raise ever-increasing quantities of food and fiber. Recently, however, interest has greatly increased in the enormous lignite and coal reserves in the Great Plains states of North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. And within the next 10 years, this region not only will be the nation's breadbasket, you will also be the supplier of enormous quantities of energy to the rest of the country. This is quite a reversal for a region which uh, only 30 years ago had little or no electric service in your rural areas. Although the REA Act was adopted in the mid-30s, as you know, the Great Plains was one of the last regions to achieve electrification. So a recent energy crisis for this region was the lack of electric service for your rural areas. And the rural people solved this crisis by organizing your own electric cooperatives, taking advantage of the 2% federal loans, and when it became available, the low-cost hydro from the federal dams. That crisis then was solved by a hard-working partnership between your locally organized cooperatives and the federal government. And the cooperatives have been completely successful in meeting your needs for electricity in the years since you organized them. Now, in the later 1950s, the Missouri River Basin Rural Electric Cooperatives faced another energy crisis when President Eisenhower, Secretary of Interior, warned that the rural consumers' needs for electricity would exceed the capability of the federal dams and that the co-ops should plan to obtain supplemental power from other sources. On the basis of their own studies and those made by Leland Oles, most of the cooperatives decided to join together to supply themselves with the needed additional power. The result of this work was the organization of Basin Electric Power Cooperative to build a 216,000 kilowatt power plant financed by an REA loan at 2% interest and fueled by this region's low-cost lignite. The plant consists of a single large generating unit 
in order to obtain the economies of large-scale operation. It was possible to locate the plant next to the lignite mine and distant from most of the member co-ops because the cooperatives were able to work out a partnership arrangement with the Bureau of Reclamation for delivery of the power. The Basin Electric plant, which went into operation in 1966, has been entirely successful in supplying the member cooperatives with the lowest cost power in the U.S., which is produced from coal. That same year, it became evident that the Basin Electric member cooperatives would need still more electricity in the 1970s. And so in 1968, we obtained another 2% REA loan, this one the largest in the history of the program, to finance a second generating unit on the lignite fields twice as big as our first one. That 460,000 kilowatt generating unit plus more than 500 miles of extra high voltage transmission line are now under construction and on schedule. And these facilities will be ready for operation in September of 1975 to supply you and other rural consumers with the additional electricity you will need by that time. This second unit also will depend upon partnership arrangements with the Bureau of Reclamation. And so once again, the rural people solved the energy crises through partnership arrangements with the federal government, but it is important to note that these arrangements were developed by your own organizations and upon your own initiatives. As a result of these efforts of the past, the rural electric co-ops now have their own reliable wholesale power supply organization. The Basin Electric engineers have shown that they can plan, design, build, and operate large, complex, and sophisticated power generation and transmission facilities to provide the electricity the rural cooperatives need. In addition, through Basin Electric, the cooperatives have forged long-term arrangements with the Bureau of Reclamation, which integrate the co-op power plants with those of the federal government on the Missouri River to maximize the efficiency of both. These arrangements also have created a joint transmission system which spans the region and interconnects all of the cooperatives. Most important, the area g and power supply cooperatives and their more than 100 local rural electric distribution co-ops are now banded together in Basin Electric, an organization which reaches from northwest Iowa to central Montana and from southern Nebraska to the Canadian border. Although individually small, by banding together, the co-ops have formed a single large organization which can negotiate with considerable strength with the great corporations which increasingly dominate the energy resources and the energy industries of this country. Basin Electric is now planning to build additional generating capacity to meet the further needs of the Missouri Basin Co-ops, this time through 1984. This planning is in cooperation with more than 100 local municipal electric systems in the region, as well as with our long-term partner, the Bureau of Reclamation. We have had some samples of the energy crisis. We have seen local shortages of gasoline, heating, oil, propane, and diesel fuel. And because of these shortages, people have been installing supplemental electric heating, electric crop dryers, and other electrical equipment. And so the rural electric cooperatives expect their loads to grow even faster in the next few years than they have in the past. Also, because of such shortages, attention is focusing now on the huge lignite and coal reserves in North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. These are some of the major reserves in the world, 
of solid fuel. Basin Electric has been using lignite on a large scale since 1966. We were the first to do so in this region. United Power Association and Minn Kota Power Cooperative soon followed suit. Today, the cooperatives have more than 600,000 kilowatts of large-scale generating capacity in operation on the lignite fields of North Dakota. Basin Electric has another 460,000 kilowatts under construction, and United Power and Minn Kota are planning to install another 1,400,000 kilowatts of additional generating capacity within the next six to eight years. So the consumer-owned cooperatives, the organizations formed by you and other rural people, are years ahead in the use of lignite on a large scale to produce electricity. Even so, this use has tapped only a small fraction of the lignite resources of North Dakota. The same is true of the huge coal reserves of Wyoming and Montana. Only a small fraction of those has been used. Until a very few years ago, it was not difficult to lease western lignite and coal resources or even to buy them outright, and the prices were low. With the approach of the energy shortage, the situation has changed rapidly and radically. The hundreds of billions of tons of lignite and coal reserves of the West no longer belong to the people of the West. They are now owned by the major oil corporations, coal companies, and to a lesser extent, power companies. The railroads own huge coal reserves in the West, which were given to them by the federal government along with the land they received in the late, uh, late years of the last century and the early years of this century. However, the federal government still owns, so they believe, most of the coal resources in Montana and Wyoming. Now, for years, the Department of Interior auctioned off federal coal lands to the highest bidder, which usually turned out to be one of the large oil or coal companies because they can outbid anybody else. Suddenly, about 18 months ago, the Department of Interior stopped selling rights to coal on federal lands. As a result, those who had been able to acquire coal reserves now possess a resource of limited supply which is in growing demand. The obvious result has been an artificial increase in the price of these western coals. And these fuel resources, which used to belong to the people of this region, are the resources upon which the cooperatives depend for producing the increasing amounts of power that you and the other rural consumers will need in future years. The increased demand for Western coal resources has occurred for several reasons. First, to supplement dwindling natural gas supplies, or we are told that they are dwindling, there are plans to process the low sulfur Western coal into pipeline gas, which incidentally will cost about four times what your present natural gas costs. Pipeline companies plan to build a large number of gasification plants in North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. Each gasification plant will consume 10 million tons of coal per year. Secondly, and at the same time, environmental requirements suddenly have been placed on industry to stop fouling the atmosphere and polluting the nation's rivers and lakes. To meet these requirements and protect the public health, the eastern electric utilities are being required to stop using high sulfur oil and high sulfur eastern coal. These utilities, therefore, are using increasing amounts of low sulfur western coal. Under these circumstances, it is plain that the coal and the lignite resources of the Missouri River Basin are going to be shipped out and in ever-increasing volume, except for that portion 
which is used to supply energy for the agriculture, the industry, the homes, and the businesses of the Missouri River Valley. The imposition of new requirements on power plants to reduce their pollution of air and water has made the energy crisis worse because of the suddenness with which it was done. This action was needed, but it should have been taken years ago. Then we could have proceeded in a more deliberate manner and avoided our current crash program. The suddenness of these cleanup requirements has caught industry with its technological pants down. There simply is not equipment developed which is capable of doing what now is required by law, such as removing uh, harmful oxides, sulfur and nitrogen, from the smokestacks of power plants. Environmental protection requirements are necessary to reduce unacceptable pollution but they also are causing delays in the construction of the new power plants and transmission lines needed to produce the electricity required. These construction delays obviously add to the current energy shortage. What about the future for the rural electric cooperatives in the Missouri Basin? We are facing new problems now and we will face more in the future because this great agricultural region, as you have been reminded today, is being called upon to expand food production greatly, not only to feed this country, but to feed the world. This will require still more energy in the form of electricity, gas, and oil. And this in the face of energy shortages. At the same time, the rest of this country wants to open up our coal reserves and industrialize areas of this region in order to supply itself with huge amounts of additional coal, pipeline gas, and electricity from the very same coal resources that we also need to use to meet the needs of an expanding Great Plains economy. Now, to cope with the changes which are coming, I do not have any pat answers. I think the main answer is in the continuing organizations which you have established. I think the cooperatives should follow their same basic policies, but more intensively. First, you should maintain not only your local and area electric cooperatives, but maintain and strengthen your regional wholesale power supply cooperative and look for additional ways in which to cooperate with each other on a regional basis. This is the only way that the cooperatives can survive in an economy which will be increasingly dominated by large national and international corporations. Second, the rural electric cooperatives need to continue and extend your long-term joint planning, which has proved so successful. We have planned jointly among ourselves and with the major federal agencies in the region and with the Nebraska Public Power Districts and with the private power companies as well. In our next project, we are planning jointly with the municipally owned electric systems. Beyond this, the several different types of cooperatives in the Missouri Basin might find more areas of common interest and look for opportunities to work together more than we have in the past. Such cooperation could be of substantial mutual benefit in coping with an energy crisis which will touch directly the lives and the livelihood of the farmers of this region. Just as the problems of obtaining water and fuel supplies and plant sites will become more difficult, environmental protection requirements may well become more demanding. And here again, the Basin Electric Cooperatives have established good basic policies. We emphasize the need for environmental protection from the day we began operation. Basin Electric was the first power producer in the entire nation to 
require its fuel supplier to contour the spoil banks and engage in experimental planting. That was 11 years ago. We have interested the Northern Great Plains Research Center of the Department of Agriculture in starting research on the difficult problems of revegetating these spoil banks which are left after the lignite has been mined. Basin Electric also took the lead in urging the North Dakota State Legislature to enact laws to protect the air and water against pollution by the lignite-based industrial development which we knew would come. We are presently installing equipment in our Leland Oils power plant in North Dakota to remove more than 99% of the fly ash before it goes up the stack, and we will be the first in the state to do this. When we became, began planning for our next generating plant a year ago, Basin Electric and the other participants asked representatives of environmental organizations to serve on an advisory committee to give us their advice and comments on our planning as it proceeds. For the future, the Basin Electric member cooperatives should continue their positive policies to protect the environment, and we should make every effort to work with the environmental organizations. Although there may be conflicting ideas on some matters, both groups represent the interests of people Neither is interested in exploitation, and there should be many possibilities for cooperation in the public interest and for solving problems constructively. Finally, the rural electric co-ops need to maintain their partnership relationships with the federal government. It is important not only to maintain but to strengthen our joint transmission and pooling arrangements with the Bureau of Reclamation. This 7,000-mile transmission grid is a public property. It is coveted by other elements in the power industry, and with good reason. The cooperatives and the municipally owned electric systems and the public power districts should make sure that this system remains their good and friendly partner and is used as it has been in the past in the interest of the people. Another area of partnership is in low-cost financing. The prospects for financing through the federal government at low cost for generating plants are bleak at the present time. Congressman Frank Denholm was a national leader in restoring the REA loan program after it had been suddenly uh, abolished by a press release on December 29 of last year. The REA loan program, which uh, Congressman Denham uh, was the leader in getting through the Congress, provides for low-cost financing. But the administration has now announced that there will be none of this low-cost financing available for co-op generating plants. There are people, including leaders in our own rural electric cooperative movement in other parts of the country, who believe this is a workable plan. I have doubts about it. I am not at all sure that the cooperatives serving the sparsely settled areas of the Great Plains can stand the cost of financing at 9% interest. To illustrate, if Basin Electric's first plant had been financed, at today's market rates, and today they would be 10%. Instead of six and a half mils per kilowatt hour, East River and Rushmore and the other members would be paying about eight and a half mils. This would be a 30% increase in wholesale power costs because of higher interest rates alone. Now, when you combine a high interest rate with the large increase in the cost of building a power plant due to inflation, the impact is multiplied. For example, the plant which we are planning to build for operation in 1979 will cost more than three times as much as the plant we completed in 1966. This increase is due largely to inflation, which was caused by 
the Vietnam War, and partly by environmental requirements. But the main increase is due to inflation, for which you get nothing. If the, this three times cost is multiplied by an interest rate, which is four times the 2% interest rate, the result is a 12 times increase in your interest costs alone between 1966 and 1979. Putting it another way, with our present plan, our interest costs us a dollar and a half a kilowatt per year, with the 1979 plant costing three times as much at a 9% interest rate, the interest cost alone on a kilowatt will be $18 a year. So I do not agree with people who say that high interest rates are anti-inflationary. And I don't think you will either when you start getting the bills. So I heartily endorse the draft resolution, which you will be considering later, to return to the extent possible to low-cost financing, not only for distribution cooperatives, but also for your generating plants. A power plant requires more capital per unit of production than any other industrial plant built. And the, therefore, it is more important to you to have low interest rate money for your generating plant than for your distribution system. In summary, then, the cooperatives in the Missouri Basin do have a promising future as long as you keep strong your regional organizations. Midwest Electric, the Missouri Basin Systems Group, and Basin Electric. The same applies to your local and area power supply cooperatives as well. With continued strong and enlightened leadership, from organizations like the South Dakota Farmers Union and like the South Dakota Power Supply Cooperatives, East River and Rushmore. The people of the rural electric cooperatives can do this. And as long as we do work together, the cooperatives will be able, in my opinion, to continue to meet your needs in the future as successfully as they have in the past. Thank you very much, and best wishes for a fine meeting.